Myanmar's military government has shown it will not give up its power without a fight. Its willingness to open fire on its own people underlines its own brutality and the bravery of those who oppose it. I'm Fazia Ibrahim. In this edition of 101 East, we look at the chance for change after four decades of military rule in Myanmar. Across this river lies Myanmar. Now we can't get into the country because the military government doesn't want the world to know what's happening within its borders. But as Chan Tao Cho reports, stories of killings and mass arrests continue to emerge from the isolated country. I can just assure you that the United States is uh, determined uh, to keep an international focus on the travesty that is taking place in Rangoon. I want to condemn absolutely the appalling level of violence against the people of Burma. It is wholly unacceptable. A protest against oppression and a brutal crackdown by a military government with no qualms about destroying its country to save itself. The regime's decision to double fuel prices in August triggered the latest demonstrations led by Buddhist monks. In this deeply religious country, it soon escalated into a protest against decades of abuse and misrule. By the end of September, up to 100,000 people reportedly took to the streets of Yangon. Al Jazeera had a correspondent there getting the reaction from the ground. The soldier, I am there trying to kill the many people that I See? We want democracy. Very, very dangerous government. The military opened fire. More than 10 died. Many others were hurt. Soldiers raided monasteries and arrested monks. Not all of them have been accounted for. Through such suppression of subversive elements, the junta of Myanmar has enjoyed nearly half a century of absolute power, despite plunging the resource-rich country into the depths of poverty. A few decades ago, this was the richest country in Southeast Asia. A military coup in 1962 ended democratic rule for the former British colony which gained independence after World War II. For the past 15 years, senior general Tan Shui has ruled the junta, which calls itself the State Peace and Development Council, with an iron fist. In this time, the country formerly known as Burma fell behind its neighbours in nearly every aspect of social and economic development. But it became among the biggest military spenders in the world. With about half a million active troops, it ranks 12th internationally for its sheer numbers. These are troops ready for deployment to gun down any threat to the junta's political stranglehold. Like in 1988, when student-led demonstrations felt the full force of its fury after protesting against the government's political and economic oppression. Shocked and angry, the people retaliated publicly against suspected government spies. The protests led to an election in 1990, won by the National League of Democracy, or NLD, a party led by the charismatic Aung San Suu Kyi. The military announced that result. Since then, she has spent most of her years under house arrest. Aung San Suu Kyi was conferred the Nobel Peace Prize in 1991 for her activism to return her country to democratic rule. 16 years later, Myanmar is anything but a democracy. A member of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, since 1997, Myanmar has ignored international criticism over the years. They expressed their revulsion to Myanmar Foreign Minister Nyan Win over reports that the demonstrations in Myanmar are being suppressed by violent force and that there's been a number of fatalities. They strongly urge Myanmar to exercise utmost restraint and to seek political solutions. Statements like these typically cut no ice with the regime, seen here entertaining a visit 
from United Nations representatives last year. Many Western nations impose sanctions and boycotts against Myanmar in response to the junta's human rights abuses. But the government continues to be propped up by trading partners in Asia. This as a result of its wealth of natural resources, including natural gas, that powerful friends like China and India help to tap and process. These problems now at this stage does not constitute a threat to international and regional peace and stability. But I think that if there is a problem, I think that others can offer help. Help is certainly needed by the people of Myanmar. How much longer can they endure this non-interference by countries that can make a difference? Rumours of a split within the military over the handling of the latest demonstrations provide a glimmer of hope, however faint. Rather than silencing opposition party NLD, which still holds moral authority over much of the country, dialogue is the first step towards national reconciliation. But what will it take for the junta to ease its fierce grip on power and move towards democracy, a progression seen as inevitable by all but itself? Joining us for more on the crisis in Myanmar, we're joined by Phil Thornton, Australian journalist and writer who's made frequent trips to interview people living in Myanmar's current state. Also, Kinoma, pro-democracy activist and member of the 88th generation students group. Kin also fled from Myanmar in 1988. Dr. Neng Ong is also a pro-democracy activist and was also part of the student uprising in 1988. Now, this isn't the first time that we're actually seeing an uprising in Myanmar. We've seen it in 1988, the student uprising. We've also seen it in uh, 1990, just after the general elections. How different is the 2000 Seven uprising. If I can start with you, Kin. Well, 2007 has uh, some difference and significant difference uh, than compared to the 1988 and also 1990. Um, one is, for example, this um, this 2007 movement is led by the the Buddhist monks, and also uh, it's more uh, coordinated, and also people are um, more determined and. Uh, because of their, their, their experience back in 1980 and 1990, knowing that this is the time that they really have to bring about the change. So they are in this mood of, this is the time. Dr. Nang, do you agree with that? Do you think that this is the time that we will see people power actually make a change, a regime change in Myanmar? Yes, yes we do. Yeah, we, um, it's a really inspiring, it's a encouraging, and then we feel the hope. At the same time, though, Phil, you know, we, we've seen the Myanmar government, we've seen the military government cracking down on the Buddhist monks. We've seen them cracking down on the protesters as well. Where is this going to go? Are you hopeful that this is the people power change that everyone's been waiting for? I think it's also people power and technological power. We've seen for the first time images coming out of Burma. Uh, we're getting phone calls still coming out of Burma. Uh, and even though there has been a crackdown, on both the people and the means of getting the message out, people are, uh, well, I, well, I can gather, they're, they're pulling back and gathering strength to keep it going. There's, there's strong support there. I've just come back from Karen State within the last hour, and uh, the Karen soldiers told me we'll be behind the students and the monk 100%, and when the time need be, we will join them and, and be with them. You've also spoken to uh, several monks as well in Myanmar. Now, are they united in this push for democracy or are we seeing a division here? Now, what we see, and I spoke to the head of the, the president of the monks union today for the Shan, the Karen and the Pao O people. And he was, I wouldn't say angry, he was determined. He offered love to the soldiers, but at the same time he said, the army can't keep breaking the back of the people and we refuse them arms because uh, he said that the arms come from the people, they're taken from the people to give to us, and the people are really, really hurt. And he pulled his robe off and he slapped the table with his robe and said, that's how determined we are. He says, they say we're fake monks, we're not, we're genuine. Kinoma, are we seeing the rise of the political monkhood? Well, I mean, in, 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 uh, throughout Burma's history, the, the Buddhist monks have always been at the forefront for the country's uh, people's you know, movement, country's affairs, for example, in, during the, the struggle for independence from British, you know, 
they took part in uh, like for example, they really took the, the role to take care of the people's well-beings, you know, the needs such as the education and you know, they really joined with the people to actually get, gain the independence. And now what they are calling is actually for the national reconciliation and also for the people to be able to meet their basic needs and release of all the political prisoners. So this is the role that they have taken before and this is not, the, not a new role or the first time that they have taken uh, uh, stand up for the people. What about the military government? How united are they in their violent response to the protests? Dr. Nang. Every army uh, is um, um, going along with the uh, government system. So Burmese, Burmese army is uh, especially a uh, bit to obey the government. So uh, no question. So this kind of uh, really uh, the, the tight uh, command system. But I mean, when we look at the, those uh, footage images, particularly shooting the, uh, the, uh, the uh, <coughs> monks and those kind of things, it is really hard for the, uh, the ordinary people or soldiers to do. What would it take for the army to turn against their own? At least that the, this uh, uh, that brutal crackdown will at least make the confusion and delusion among the, uh, the grassroots soldiers and rank and fine. That definitely, it will happen. That will be going. Phil, I just want to throw this to you. What will it take for the army or those who are under the command of the military uh, regime to actually move away or step down or perhaps take off their uniforms and join the protests? Well, I think uh, there's probably cracks already. I spoke to deserters today, two deserters. Uh, they're the lower echelons of the ranks and they see the difference between what the officers get and what they get. So uh, they're treated as bad as the people in some cases. So, and when they see the beloved uh, monks getting battered, that may be the, the straw that breaks the bank. But this is a nasty, nasty, nasty regime that's insulated itself from the world. I mean, it's a narco economy. It's based on illicit drugs. Uh, one of five children under five will die before the fifth birthday. So we, we all know the pictures there, the statistics are there, but the will has to also come from the West. We owe some responsibility. We can't stand by any longer and see the Burmese people driven into the ground. We'll leave the discussion there for now. We'll be back in just a moment.